Hi friends and welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about, probably going to be spending more time than usual. My videos are usually pretty short, 10, 15, 20 minutes, but this one is going to run longer. And I'll try and put some uh, time stamps in the description box down below after I go back, edit, and look at everything. But this is the Medieval Scapini Tarot. It's been around since I believe 84 or 85. And uh, the artist and author is Luigi Scapini. His deck is called a medieval deck. It's not actually a reproduction of a medieval deck, but it's a modern creation that's made to look medieval. And how this came about was Luigi Scapini was commissioned by uh, U.S. Games to complete some of the missing cards that were in the Visconti tarot decks that are from the early 1400s. And so he did uh, kind of copy and imitate the style of that art, create some of the missing cards. And in so doing, he was inspired to create his own tarot deck in a medieval style. And I think the results are wonderful. I love this deck. I initially ordered it by mistake. A few weeks ago, I ordered this. Uh, this is the deck available today on the mass market, the Medieval Scapini by U.S. Games. It's available for less than $20, and I ordered it mistakenly believing that it was uh, actually a historical reproduction deck, and it's not. But after I got to researching this deck, I became intrigued and interested, and after I went through the cards, I just absolutely fell in love with it. So this video is going to be done in several parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Little White Book, and this is an older book that's no longer in print, but it's an excellent reference and resource for the deck, and for tarot in general. So I had to go uh, look on that eBay to find this book, and it cost me like 50 bucks, but I think it was well worth it. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time comparing and contrasting. I also was able to pick this. This is one of the original editions from 1985. The medieval Scapini and the artwork is actually identical to this deck but the printing process and the clarity of the artwork is much clearer in this older deck. However, we'll go through it together. I think you'll agree that uh, even the contemporary deck that's available and printed today is still a very good, uh, a very good deck to work with. The, the differences between the two are subtle. And so we're going to go through, and I will enlarge and show you the differences in the uh, resolution and the fineness of the artwork in the older deck as opposed to the newer deck. So well, let's get started. This is our little white book. The little white book in both of my decks, both the 35-year-old uh, deck and the modern deck, they're both the same, the same book. And this is uh, a very detailed little white book talks about the deck in general. Copyright 1985 U.S. Games. Introduction by Stuart Kaplan. Introduction to Tarot. And then they go through all the cards in the entire deck. Uh, the, the whole book is in English. There are no multiple languages. And for every card, there's a paragraph or two uh, describing the images that you see, the symbols that you see, why they were chosen. Then they also cover divinatory me meanings and reverse meanings. So it's a very thorough book for a little white book. More than, more than a lot of little white books. Let's see, then after we go through the cards, there's a little brief information on the uh, Celtic cross, or what they call the ten card spread. And that is it. Now, if you are interested in delving further into the deck, this is a book that was not written by Luigi Scapini. It was written by Ronald Decker. I'm presuming that the Little White Book was written by Luigi Scapini because that's what it says. So I'm taking him at face value. This book, however, was written by Ronald Decker, and so it's his commentary on what he sees in the medieval Scapini tarot. But the book also has very fascinating information. So I have only read the first couple of uh, chapters in the book. 
the book is divided into sections. There's a foreword that's very interesting in and of itself. There are five parts. Part one, Levy's theories involving astral light and Kabbalah. Part two dissects the major arcana and how it relates to uh, alchemy, astronomy, the Kabbalah. So if you want to go and delve into those areas, you can. You don't have to with this deck, but you could. Uh, part three goes through the minor arcana and relating to the elements and so forth. And part four is the compendium of, uh, compendium of cards where they uh, go through major and minor arcana. Let's see. And then each card, there's a little grayscale, uh, bigger than a thumbnail. It's a pretty decent sized image. I'm going through all of the majors in chapter 11. And so he's got a little bit more information than the little white book a couple of paragraphs rather than just one brief paragraph and then we go through all the minor arcana and so together between Luigi Scapini's booklet and Ronald Decker's more in-depth analysis you can get a really good feel for this deck and for tarot in general okay so let's move on to the next part of the video where we're going to compare uh, the card quality after I bought my new deck, I got to reading on Eclectic Tarot and there was a big discussion about the older deck having artwork that was clearly superior to the newer deck and I wasn't really sure, I couldn't find anything on YouTube, any videos comparing, any, any website that compared the two editions to see what the difference was for myself. So I looked on eBay and found uh, one of the original editions for not too much. I think it was like $35 plus shipping. So I did buy the older edition and the newer edition. So the modern deck comes in a flip top box. There is the little white book, the same as the original little white book. A little brighter and fresher because it's new. And this is my older edition. This is what they call a uh, window cutout here. And the box was originally glued here, but the glue has given away, which is all right. I'm going to just put my deck into a bag. And so here are the decks side by side. As you can see, they're the same size. The artwork is the same. Um, there is a slight difference in thickness of the decks, very slight. The older deck, this is the older deck over here, it's got slightly thicker cardstock. The newer deck, the cardstock is a little thinner. Color-wise, the newer printing is very ever so slightly uh, a little bit duller than the older edition. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit more closely examine these cards. Let's see here. So not a big appreciable difference. So not much of a difference in the title card. Here you can see a little bit of a difference in the cards. And I don't know, I have such a glare from my light here, I'm going to move it. That's a little better. Now this older edition appears to have a little more um, glimmer, a little, a little more gold to the background, whether the newer edition is a little more bronzy rather than gold. Just very subtle difference. The face of the fool. 
It's a little a little duller here, a little brighter here. Here is the old or the new edition, and this is the old edition. So it's much more clearly defined, a cleaner, cleaner look. This is the newer edition. The lines are not quite as fine and delicate. This is the older edition. The face is much more clearly defined. I didn't see much of a difference in this Magician card. I thought they both looked pretty similar. Again, the face is a little more clearly defined in the older edition. It's a very subtle difference. You can see it a little bit better in the Popus, which would be the High Priestess in a modern theme deck. Her face is brighter and cleaner in this uh, older edition. Even her eyes sort of have a little more pop to them in the older edition. Here's another card where you can pretty much see a difference. The older and the newer edition. If you see the, uh, the bird in the crest, it's much more clearly defined in the older edition. The newer edition, it's not quite as clearly defined. And if you look at these cards, the Montegna tarot cards that are underneath, they are much more clearly defined in the older edition rather than the newer. Here is the newer edition. Very difficult to see what's going on in these cards. And in the older edition, you can actually see it. So for general reading it wouldn't matter too much. I mean you can tell for a general reading they're both the Empress, they both look pretty similar. But if you really want to study the cards and understand and see what's going on in all the little detail, the older edition is more clearly defined. Here's the Emperor which is a depiction of Stuart Kaplan. And as you can see the older edition his face is much more clearly defined and cleaner. Very subtle difference in a lot of these. Very, very subtle. But it's there. This one, the robe, is a little more gold. This one in the robe is a little more bronze. The face of the Pope. Very, very similar. The differences are almost non discernible. If you look at the beard, it's just ever so slightly clearer and crisper in the older edition. Same with the lovers. So I don't want to go through the whole deck like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through with the older edition. After I bought my new deck, I got to reading on Eclectic Tarot, and there was a big discussion about the older deck having artwork that was clearly superior to the newer deck. And I wasn't really sure, and I couldn't find anything on YouTube, any videos comparing, any, any website that compared the two editions to see what the difference was for myself. So I looked on eBay and found uh, one of the original editions for not too much. I think it was like $35 plus shipping. So I did buy the older edition and the newer edition. Suffice it to say that the newer edition is ever so slightly less clear than the older edition. And I don't think it's enough to really be an impediment to reading or using the deck. You can see in this, check out the horse and rider above Justice's head. Ever so slightly cleaner in the older deck. The same way with the Hermit.
look around the hermit's mouth and all the detail at the bottom. Wheel of Fortune, you can really see a big difference in this card. The older edition is very clearly superior than the newer edition. Take a look at the circle, the wheel, and the detail of the items. You can really see it in the older card. The detail is very crisp and clean. The newer edition, not so easy to tell. The face of the man drowning below down there. To me, this is the most striking difference is in this wheel. So much brighter in the older edition. The face of the person on top. So that kind of gives you an idea of the difference between the older and newer edition. Probably not enough to make a big difference to most people. It's a very, very minor, subtle difference. For instance, take a look at the signature of the artist in both of these cards. Much more crisp and clean here, you can read it. Here you can't really read it. It says Luigi Scapini. Okay, so I don't want to go through the whole deck like that. I think we've, we've uh, showed you enough so that you can see the difference for yourself. And if it's significant, you'll want to look on eBay and look for an older deck. But, you know, if you're like most of us, the newer deck is just fine. Then let's compare the card backs from the older and the newer edition. This card back is the newer edition. This card back is the older edition. So as you can see, there's a subtle difference. Sorry, I'm trying to get it so the glare is not interfering too greatly. The older edition, again, has more clearly defined lines. Uh, the gold is more uh, deep, whereas in the newer edition, Hard back. It's a little lighter. Lighter in color, less gold. So there is a subtle difference between the two. So let's go through the deck. Um, I have to tell you that I've only read a few chapters of this book, Art and Arcana, and while I believe it's a valuable tarot reference in general, I don't know that you really need it because this little white book is very thorough. It's a good reference, and it's very concise. And so unless you're really interested in getting into history of tarot and into a lot of the more esoteric uh, systems behind tarot, then you probably wouldn't need this big book, so I wouldn't worry about that. So let us go through and take a look at the cards here. So here we have the Fool, and I'm going to read to you a little bit from the Little White Book. The Fool, dressed in ragged clothes, stands dangerously near the edge of an abyss. On his head are four feathers, white for the suit of swords, red for wands, aqua for cups, and gold for coins. He carries a rough stick over his left shoulder. On the end of the stick is a pig's bladder, symbolizing Saint Roche, R-O-C-H, a victim of the plague who wandered in the wilderness as an outcast. In the fool's right hand is a stick. A small lion leaps fiercely on his leg, and a wilted flower with thorny petals is at his feet. A crocodile lurks in the abyss among pieces of a broken obelisk. The Magician. 
A young man dressed in red stands at a three-legged table. His hat is luxurious and wide-brimmed, symbolizing the triumph of thought and intellect. On the table are symbols of three tarot suits, sword, cup, and coins, and in his hand is a wand. The wilted flower that was at the feet of the fool is now revived, and the stony ground resembles the skin of the crocodile which the magician has conquered through will. The Popis. The slender young Popis gazes from her throne with serenity and wisdom. Her robes are dark blue, symbolizing feminine intuition, and a crescent moon crowns her tiara. In her right hand is the Book of Life, its cover inscribed with the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, and in her left hand are a gold key and a silver key. At her breast is a Maltese cross joined with a child's head, referring to the legend of Pope Joan, the female pope. Behind her shoulders is a veil supported by the sun and the moon, with rainbows streaming down on each side. The arches column to her left is supported by a black sphinx and symbolizes the feminine side of life, incorporating a mermaid who was offered an apple by a demonic serpent. Let me get in so you can see that a little bit better. The fiery column on her right is masculine, and in it are little flames, water drops, a salamander, and a bat. The popus's foot rests on a grass-green cushion. The checkered floor gives way to life and nature. The empress sits majestically on a throne whose back forms a gothic arch with wings and a clear blue sky. On her head is a crown with nine stars for the nine muses of music, poetry, and science, and 12 stars for the 12 houses of the zodiac. Her gown is red for passion, tempered by cool blue, which flows around her like fertile waters. She holds a shield emblazoned with the imperial eagle, and in her left hand is a scepter topped with an orb. The platform on which she is seated is supported by the Taroki of Montegna, cards showing the seven liberal arts, grammar, logic, rhetoric, geometry, arithmetic, music, and poetry, along with philosophy, astrology, and theology. At her feet is a crescent moon, and a lily at the side of her throne denotes purity. Really like that empress. The Emperor. Many details point to the Emperor's rank as supreme ruler of the elements. The awesome and potentially destructive powers of the four elements are represented by pictures of apocalyptic landscapes showing winds for air, volcanic land for earth, burning buildings for fire, this is at the bottom, and ships sinking for water. Bracing the platform are four creatures, a he-goat, a lion, a dog, and the creation of Frankenstein. The platform and its symbols represent the elemental chaos which the emperor rules and puts to order. The yellow cube on which the ruler sits is draped with a fiery red robe. The colors are of power and activity. The emperor himself is dressed in armor designed after that depicted on the sepulcher of Emperor Rudolf of Habsburg, 1218 to 1291. And he wears a large hat lined in ermine, topped at the crown with pyramids and decorated with the imperial eagle. On his breast are the sun and its moon. A gold braid, a token from the empress, is draped at his neck. The tulip that appeared with the fool and the magician appears at the back of his throne. He holds a lily-headed scepter with a crescent moon at, his, at its handle. The facial features of the Emperor are those of Stuart R. Kaplan, president of U.S. Games System, whom the ar artist wished to honor as patron of the deck. Very cool. Love that Emperor. The Pope. A jovial face augments the benevolence of the Pope, yet his hair is white and his face lined with experience. He raises his right hand in blessing, and his left hand is a staff with the symbols of the planets Mercury, the Sun, the Moon, 
Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn at the top, and the thunderbolt of Jupiter at the bottom. The three rings of his tiara show at the bottom the natural world. In the middle, the crown of thorns with Christ's passion representing worldly life and free will, and at the top, the spiritual realm, represented by simple triangles and circles with the cross surmounting the whole. The two pillars behind him are from the Ciborium of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. At the foot of the throne, the seven vices are depicted from left to right, pride, wrath, lust, gluttony, envy, sloth, and avarice. The Pope triumphs over the sins of the world. Two monks kneel, one on each side of the platform. The angle of the throne, which seems to be leaning forward, symbolizes the mercy and receptiveness to the needs of others. The Lovers is modeled on the same card from the 15th century Visconti Sforza Tarot. A man and a woman clasp hands, the woman gazing at the man and the man looking upward. They willingly pledge their love and their desire to stay with one another as they stand on a forking path near an abyss. On the left is a rugged and hard land, the choice of virtue. On the right is a pleasant and sunny land, the choice of vice. Above the two lovers is the centaur, Chiron, who was renowned for his beneficence and wisdom. After his death, he was exalted to become the constellation Sagittarius, the zodiacal sign that rules free choice. The charioteer rides over a landscape that recalls northern Italy, near Verona at the foot of the Alps. The square chariot is sheltered by a canopy lined with gold stars on a deep blue background. The charioteer has the qualities of the zodiacal sign of Aries. He holds a scepter composed of a rod with a sphere and an arrow, and he controls the horse's reins with the golden ring. A blue crescent and a red crescent on his shoulders represent knowledge of the past and the future. The white horse pulls upward, while the black horse pulls earthward, indicating the two impulses of human nature toward spirituality and sensuality. The charioteer must learn to control the horses so that they can function in harmony. The horse's tails together form an image of a winged seed, denoting the potential embodied by the chariot. And we have, in the older tradition, we have justice at number eight. The woman signifying justice has a sophisticated face, for she must be discriminating and knowledgeable. Her dress is red and blue with the gold lining. Her headdress is composed of three towers with three doors, like the temple of the great fertility goddess, Diana of Ephesus. She wears a golden braid at her elongated neck, and the neckline of her dress is anchor-shaped. In her right hand, Justice holds a sword, and in her left hand, a scale. She is surrounded by a curious arch, the pillars of which are breasts, again referring to the goddess Diana of Ephesus, whose holy image depicts a woman with a multitude of breasts. An Amazon, one of the legendary female warriors of ancient times, is in the lunette above her. Two suns provide illumination. On the sides, scenes of the four seasons are shown. The fertility symbols of the design indicate that although justice may seem severe to wrongdoers, the world is best when justice prevails. The Hermit. An old man holds up a lamp shaped like an hourglass. He supports himself with a staff on which are seven roses and a snake. The roses on his staff symbolize the seven stages of growth from a bud to the fully open flower. The twisted snake bites its own tail, symbolizing eternity. The hermit's hat is like those worn by the monks of Mount Athos of Greece, as is his gown, which was originally black, but has been faded by the sun. His underdress is made of woven straw. In the background is Mount Athos, and at his feet is the sea. The boats and the whale in the foreground refer to the Old Testament prophet Jonah, who was miraculously saved from drowning when he was swallowed by a whale. Later, his preaching saved the city of Nineveh from destruction by God. 
Look how cute that is. He's got a little uh, paper boat with his signature. Cute. There are a lot of humorous elements to this deck. If you kind of look in the details, you'll occasionally pick something up like that. Wheel of Fortune is gold, and on it are the symbols of the zodiac. Behind the wheel, Blind Fortune stands. Her wings, hands, and head touch the wheel in seven places, symbolizing the seven planets of the ancients. Her wings are red, and behind her, a blue circle represents individual life. Two boats with figureheads like twisting snakes support the wheel and also bind fortune's feet. Below are the green waters of life. The ruler of the wheel, fixed at the top, holds a sphinx and a sword. On the right, a blue figure ascends, chasing a golden crown. On the left, an older man is afire while he hurls downward, grasping for his golden crown, which will soon be enveloped by the waves. Below, an old man flails helplessly in the water. Kind of cool. Good Wheel of Fortune. I don't normally see many Wheel of Fortunes that I like, but that's a good one. And we have Force or Strength at number 11 in this deck, instead of number 8, as you might be used to from uh, Rider Waite decks. A tall, strong woman calmly grasps the jaws of a lion with one hand. She is modeled on a painting by the Renaissance master Piero della Francesca. Her hat has the lemniscate, traditional for this figure of the tarot. A golden braid at her neck links her with the emperor and justice. The landscape is stony and dry. In the background is Hermes with the head of the sun. Hermes was the Greek god of alchemy. And his image here is from a medal which commemorated a successful alchemical operation. The Hanged Man. The imagery of the Hanged Man runs with the blood of sacrifice. The scaffold is twined with grapes that ooze red juice. At the foot of the right pillar is a pelican, the bird which, according to legend, feeds her children with her own blood, and which was frequently shown in the allegorical art at the top of Christ's crucifix. Nearby is a sacrificial lamb, its throat cut. On the left, a dragon bites its tail, illustrating the occult law that which is above is the same as that which is below. The hammer, nails, and pinchers are traditional symbols of Christ's passion. The hanged man himself seems complacent as he dangles above whirling waters. The buttons of his shirt and trousers number 22, the number of the major arcana of the tarot. Coins drop from the crescents formed by his pockets and splash in the water. death. I love this death card. A skeleton dances on blue ground holding a scythe whose handle used to be a human spine. The pose of death resembles that of Shiva, Hindu god of destruction. A raven, symbol of decomposition, glides nearby. The landscape is strewn with human hands and feet, but the hands indicate that new energy is coming forth as emphasized by the green plants below. Three heads are in the foreground. On the right is a woman's head and in the middle a child's. The artist admits that he too is subject to the great power of death and his portrait appears with palette in the bottom left corner. So this is a self-portrait of Luigi Scapini. He's got his signature, his face, and his palette there in the death card. An angel pours liquid from one vessel to another. The golden urn is solar, embodied by a lion, and the silver vessel is lunar, embodied by a crescent. Together they symbolize the harmonious mix of masculine and feminine. The mysteriously androgynous features of the angel resemble those of John the Baptist in the paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. On the forehead is a solar disk. The angel's swan wings denote alchemical ablution. On the left is a wilted flower, and on the right is a scene of Christ's baptism as the dove of the Holy Spirit descends. The baptism scene is taken from a fresco by the artist in the church of Santa Croce in Verona, Italy.
the devil. The body of the devil embraces the four elements. His wings symbolize air. His red face symbolizes fire. The scales on his legs symbolize water and the goat legs, earth. A mouth on his belly mockingly protrudes a red tongue. His wings and the star on his forehead indicate that once the devil was one of the angels of heaven known as Lucifer, bringer of light. In his left hand, the devil holds a sword without a hilt as a symbol of the unleashed sexuality and his fiery right hand makes the occult sign of greeting. Two horns and animal ears add to the bestial quality of the creature. Female breasts indicate that the devil is not really a he, but rather has the qualities of both sexes. A gold male demon and a green female demon at his feet also emphasize that both sexes can take on the qualities of the devil. They dance the tango, a dance of sensuousness, and they are tethered in the devil's pedestal with golden ropes. Three steps on which the demon's feet are placed symbolize hierarchy and diabolic initiation. Flames leap through fissures on the stony floor. The Falling Tower With foundation set in sand, the tower is made of seven cubicle stories like the Tower of Babel. There are three doors, the Gothic door at the top representing faith and the square door on the lower left representing experience. The tip of an obelisk emerges from the top of the tower. A stroke of solar lightning demolishes the top of the tower and the mushroom cloud that expands evokes nuclear catastrophe. Satellites, bombs, stars, and debris fall through the sky. A king falls on the left. He is shaped like a Hebrew letter, A-N, A-Y-I-N. Another figure motionless on the ground is struck on the neck with the brick. So I just wanted to add a little personal commentary here. So even though this is a um, deck made in a classical style, there are a lot of modern elements in here. As they mentioned in the uh, deck here, we've got satellites, bombs, there's a traffic signal. This kind of looks like a spaceship. I mean, if you really examine these closely, there's a lot of fine detail with a lot of interesting and quirky artwork. Although, just to look at the card, a uh, gross glance in general, it just looks like your traditional tarot tower card. So even though there are these little elements, they're not, they're not distracting from the general overall meaning of the card, but they're there in case you want to delve further into the meaning that the artist wanted to give the card. The Star A young woman kneels on the edge of a pond. Her long blonde hair flows around her naked body to meet the ground perfectly. In her left hand is a Doric proto-geometric vase indicating Doric rusticness and simplicity. In her right hand is an attic vase reflecting elegance and fine intelligence. Above her are two stars, one with eight points and the other with five points, and symbols of the seven planets of the ancients. Near her is a Rosicrucian rose which is reflected on the water. A raven perches on the rose as a personal sigil of the artist who was inspired by the star. Two hills are behind the woman, and an acacia bush on one of the hills is a symbol of grace and love. The moon. Shadows play over a scene lit only by the moon. Anubis, the Egyptian god of the dead, sits in the form of an elegant violet dog at the foot of a tower. Across from him, a wolf howls. On one tower is an astrologer from ancient times, and on the other tower is Galileo's telescope. Drops of moisture fall from the clouds, lit by a crescent moon with masculine features. A huge crayfish emerges from a murky pond in the foreground. The sun. A white horse bears a young boy and girl. The boy is Hercules and he carries the sun over his head while the girl holds a distaff. The white horse is a symbol of that which serves love and it dances in a circle of paradisiacal flowers. 
A lyre, symbol of the Greek sun god Apollo, leans on the wall, and on the other side is an egg, recalling the virtue of love of the twin brothers Castor and Pollux, who were born from an egg. A sturdy wall encloses the scene. Again, I'm just reading the card description. I'm not reading you the divinatory meanings or the reverse meanings. Judgment. A city of tombs is awakened by the trumpet blast of an angel. A woman and two men, one very old, emerged from three of the tombs, while hands groping from other tombs recall the imagery of the death card. The hair of the angel spirals and whirls while its billowing clothes and the clouds surrounding it are like the swan constellation of the Milky Way galaxy. Here is the final card for the Major Arcana, the world. A young girl, almost a child, stands nude in the middle of a wreath. She holds two wands, one black and one white. The wreath around her is composed of flowers and fruit and is twined with the alchemical snake. At the corners are the symbols of the elements and of the planets. Stars are above, near an angel and an eagle, and clouds billow fire below, near a lion and a bull. Medieval symbolism matches the lion with the element fire and the evangelist St. Mark, the bull with earth and St. Luke, the angel or man with air and St. Matthew, and the eagle with water and St. John. Very nice explanation in this little white book for the elements. And these are elements that are in quite a few tarot decks, not just this deck. So it's worth getting this deck in this little white book just to learn more about tarot in general. Alrighty, now we're going to move on to the minor arcane. And I hope you don't mind. I don't want to rush through this deck. I'd like to read the descriptions for the minor arcana as well. So if you do not wish to listen to the description of the symbols in the cards, you can just kind of fast forward through this part here. But for those who are interested, I'd like to read the uh, card description. I'm going to move get in a little closer so I don't have to be going back and forth. King of Swords, a young blonde man clad completely in armor sits on a hexagonal throne. He holds a sword with the hilt shaped as the ancient swastika and its pommel wrought as the head of an eagle. On his shoulders are Urim and Thummim, the oracle of the Old Testament. The king's spurs are arrows. Under his feet are the tablets of law. His throne floats among whirling blue clouds and the limbs of peach trees announce the coming of spring. An elegant woman sits on a high gothic column. Her throne houses a raven at her left leg. Below her are sinister images, two witches on broomsticks, a beer drawn by, by black horses and a march of Ku Klux Klan members. The queen herself, I'd like to say a little something about that as well. I've heard people say they couldn't pick up this deck or they didn't want to work with it because the author himself admits these are Ku Klux Klan members and I'd just like to make note of the fact that we also have an entire card, the devil himself. So I think the point is that the artist included these Ku Klux Klan members for a particular reason and not, you know, it's not as a symbol that he's endorsing Ku Klux Klan, but it's a symbol of sort of the dark or the um, the shadow side of the Queen of Swords card. That's all I take it as. Bad uh, associations, or I know there are a lot of negative associations with a lot of elements that we see in our tarot decks, but that's those are there for a reason, and that's to make us think about them. So let's continue on. The Queen herself is in a twisted position. Her right arm with wiry fingers crosses her body to support a large sword, and on her sword arm is a snake bracelet. She wears a cuirass under her blue and white robes. On the hilt of the sword are a swan, three coats of arms, and a crown with the symbols of the world. Her face is aristocratic, refined, and haughty. A black net covers her face and hands, and she is crowned with two crescent moons. Knight of Swords. A horse and rider in full armor gallop wildly in a desolate landscape. Peacock feathers are at the knight's helmet. 
and on the horse's head is a red dragon. Another oriental symbol, the yin-yang sign, is at the horse's flank. On the front of the horse is a fierce face. The knight's foot is bare, although he wears a dangerously pointed spur on it. The spiked collar of a watchdog clatters on the horse's leg. On the ground is a broken arrow and three flowers, one of which grows through a skull. And in that skull we see the signature of the artist. Another kind of humorous twist there. Page of Swords. The decadent character of the Commedia dell'arte, Brigella, stands in a setting like that used in the play. Brigella was a sly villain who would do anything for money. He wears white robes trimmed in green and lined in yellow, and a peacock feather decorates his floppy hat. Armor glints under his robes. His ears are pointed and decorated with golden roses, and a snake is draped at his neck. He slyly covers one eye with one hand, while his other hand holds a sword with a fox head handle. A black cat slinks out in front of him, and the moon is waning among the clouds. Ten of Swords. Ten swords are intric intricately intertwined. On their hilts, the betrayers of Caesar clutch bloody daggers. Near the sword points are graveyard flowers, chrysanthemums, while in the center is the Lord of the Flies, another name for Satan, who lays its eggs on corpses. Three women dressed in black wail and scratch their cheeks. They are hired mourners at a funeral. So yeah, pretty dark card. Not too far off from Rider Waite, portraying the Ten of Swords as gloom and doom. Nine of Swords. Nine swords are neatly crossed in a grid. Veiled figures are seen on the hilts of the swords. The tomb of a holy and pure hermit monk is seen in the foreground. On the monk is a lily, and his arms are crossed at his chest. The sarcophagus is made of the same material, red sandstone, that the Queen of Swords is perched on. On the sides are scenes of decay. A strong man oppressing a weak man and people stricken with the plague. On the right of the tomb, a fetal figure crouches, and to the left, the page of swords, now aged and demented, huddles in a knot. Eight of swords, a conspirator is being judged by a wigged and robed magistrate. The defendant, pale and fevered, wears black tights and a white shirt and is caged in by swords, the hilts of which are postillion horns. The judge holds a gavel. Nearby is a table containing surgical instruments and under the table is a syringe filled with blood. Two night birds, one male and one female, gaze ominously out of the card. Seven of Swords, an alchemist who has already found immortality, performs the operation in which the seven colors of the rainbow can be seen as symbolized by the rainbow and the raven. The man is so old that he has lost all of his hair, and his features appear as those of an ancient child. The raven flies away with his gold ring, and the harpies at the hilts of the sword turn the seven colors into poisonous vapors. Six of Swords. Six swords form a mandala with an illuminated center indicating sudden enlightenment by divine grace. The hilts of the swords are messages sealed with black ribbon and blazing with light. The rider, St. Paul, falls from his horse on the road to Damascus when God makes his presence known to him. The horse rears in fear and Paul is blinded by the divine presence. Five of Swords. A man sprawls on the floor of a tumbling shack. He smokes opium with the hookah, and his slippers are like those of a decadent rajah. Behind him are prayer books and tomes of black magic. The hilts of the five swords are like vampires, creatures that prey on the life force of others. Four of Swords. A warrior who has renounced the world seeks refuge in a hermit's hut that he has made for himself, using burlap and four swords. He wears a simple white robe fastened with the rope knotted four times for four vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, plus a fourth secret vow. The stigmata are on his hands. His posture, 
with his hands open and his face to the sky, is ecstatic like that of St. Francis, who kneels by a small hut in the background. In front of the hermit are a bowl of water and a mandrake root, his sustenance. Three of Swords, a young man is being sent away by his family. The child and baby have eyes like the father, symbolizing the I Ching trigram, the first, second, and third son respectively. The young man has eyes like his mother. He is like the biblical prodigal son as symbolized by the pig in the three, and the three acorns. In one of his bags are coins, and in the other is a prostitute. The feather in his hat is shaped as a question mark. The imagery of the card relates to the fool as emphasized by the tarot of Marseille fool. The Visconti Sforza Fool Tarot Fool and the Tarot of Montagna Fool, all found on the three hilts of the swords. So you can see the three different fools on the hilts of these swords. There's the third one. Under the Tarot of Montagna Fool, who is on the sword cross sideways, is the symbol of the anti-war movement. Oh, I see it. It's here in the hilt. Is it like a peace symbol there? Interesting. Two of Swords. Two strong warriors meeting under a cloudy sky shake hands in token friendship. They could destroy each other, but their solution is to have a formal friendship. So it's kind of the idea of truce, like the, um, like the Thoth Tarot. The pale warrior on the left represents yin, the feminine nature. A snake is on his helmet and a dragon is on the hilt of his sword. On the right is a yang or masculine type. His face is sanguine and foxes are on his helmet and the handle of his sword. So here we have the ace of swords. Wow, it's a very busy card. A great sword stands impressively against the sky. It is crowned at its tip with a golden fillet set with the suit symbols of spades, with yellow lightning interspersed. Two wings are beside the tip of the blade. The palms of secret martyrdom droop from the crown, and red and blue flames shower from the palms. A snake with two horns and a forked tongue is wrapped around the blade of the sword. At the hilt is the symbol of yin-yang. Below is a statue of victory encircled with the laurel wreath. Abel kneels on the right, holding a lamb in his arms, gazing upward, and Cain kneels on the left, holding the produce of the earth and gazing downward. So now we'll move on to the suit of wands. Look at that king of wands. My goodness. What a great card. A barbaric king, primitive, strong, and bold, sits on a rustic throne made of pickaxes, spades, and rough boards. At the top are two horns and sheaves of rushes with a candle burning in the center. His crown is made of copper wrought in the shade of, shape of acorns. His beard and hair are red and wiry. The armor he wears is of copper decorated with flames and a goat's head, which is partly hidden behind the club he holds. A tankard of beer is at his feet. An ancient Japanese oil lamp and a brazier roasting three chestnuts lie on a carpet of dry leaves. In the background is an autumnal wood and golden light. That's a beautiful card. I love that one. Oh, I love this one too. Queen of Wands. The Queen of Wands gazes amiably from her country armchair. Her bosom is full and motherly, her arms sturdy and well-shaped. Like the king, she is red-haired, and her copper crown is wrought as flames. A tabby cat is curled in her lap, and she holds a branch of red flowers. A crescent moon is at the left post of her chair, and a lion's fur is under her feet. To the left and right, two babies, one black and one white, sleep peacefully. Sunflowers grow in the background. Oh, look at the babies. I hadn't noticed those when I flipped through the deck. Wow, that lion, that's awesome. This is a great card. Here's the Knight of Wands. A hun riding a horse on the top of a wall observes a migration of people as they depart from a town in Central Asia. The town, once built of masonry and then rebuilt in wood, is now aflame, turning the sky violet. An ancient Orthodox cathedral can be seen beneath the guard tower. 
The people carry their goods in wagons and lead the cattle with them. The Hun wears hides and his armor is made of leather. He carries a large club and his horse bears a drum. The horse is harnessed in dragon leather and a rampant lion ornaments its head. Page of Wands A black torch bearer has just been freed. A green metal shackle is still at his ankle. He wears solar colors, and a lion's skin is draped over him. He rests the tip of a large club in a bed of ashes in which the tail of the lion and the ends of his socks trail. An orchid grows from the club, and another red flower is on the page's hat. In the background, a jungle of lush flowers and rich fruit is threatened by fire. Beautiful card. This suit I'm really loving. Ten of Wands. Two merchants lead mules, overburdened with gold and other wares, down a road. The bushes and trees at the roadside conceal ten bandits, armed with clubs, strengthened by iron rings. The colors of the foliage indicate that autumn is approaching. Nine of Wands. A group of bandits, like Robin Hood's Band of Merry Men, doze in a forest after a bout of drinking. Their clothes follow the progression of the rainbow. Meanwhile, at the top of the card, Saracens approach in galleys. Despite the calmness of the scene, the merry men may soon sense the approach of danger. Eight of Wands. Eight stakes support vines bearing ripe grapes. Soon wine will be made in the village. Among the vines in the foreground, a youth declares his love to a coy woman. In the middle, the same couple is seen fighting, kicking, slapping, and biting. At the top, a boy and a girl play, running and weaving in and out among the vines. The children wear red and blue, like the couple. Seven of Wands, a flushed fanatic speaker uses seven clubs as his podium. He waggles one finger at his listeners while making the sign of victory with his other hand. The listener in yellow expresses doubt while the man dressed in black rags shows despair. A strong young sportsman dressed in white listens attentively. Meanwhile, a man in the violet costume of Pantalon de Bisognosi, a Venetian mask character, receives gold coins from the bodice of the woman in blue. The artist was inspired by a scene in Hyde Park, London, but scenes like this have taken place in cities all over the world for centuries. We've got little clubs, like symbols from the modern playing cards, the little trefoil, which is associated with the suit of wands. Six of wands. This is the card of servants. They wear the livery of the house of the suit of wands, the same worn by the page of wands. So this is different from the Rider Waite interpretation of a victorious uh, entrant. Let me continue to read here. They wear the livery of the house of the suit of wands, the same worn by the page of wands. In the top row is a coachman, next a jester wearing motley. He holds a club on which a tambourine, which also functions as a candelabrum, is fastened with ribbons. On the right is a black mace bearer wearing a white wig. At the bottom left is a gardener with a hoe. A horn for water hangs from his belt. A cook is shown, his club hung with four small baskets containing figs, plums, fish, lemons, and a silver pail of wine. Finally comes the scullery maid, her hair in a kerchief and a broom in her hand. That's a very busy card. Kind of cool. And the divinatory meaning they give is the, actually the same as Rider Waite. It's just the way the artist envisions it is a little different. Divinatory meaning is conquest, triumph. Good news, gain, advancement, expectation. So you just have to kind of work with the decks that are a little different from Rider Waite to get a little sense of how the artist viewed the sense that that chord normally portrays for most of us. Five of Wands. Five men engaged in a furious struggle using clubs as weapons. Two of the clubs are oak, two birch, and one poplar. A sixth character rubs his hands together gleefully, for he will exploit the struggle to his advantage. 
and although not directly participating, he will emerge the winner. He has a solar symbol on his sleeves, a bag of golden coins at his waist, a coin at his neck, and emerald rings. Very cool. Unsatisfied desires, struggle, labor, violence, strife, conflict. Four of Wands. Four men clasp hands in a pact of friendship, and the first foundation of a secret society is made. The man in blue represents the medieval inhabitants of towns near the sea. The dark man in red is a gypsy from a warm climate, while the freckled man in yellow is from northern countries. The man in white represents the meeting of all colors and, alchemically, the passage to a new triad. All four wear earrings. The garland of leaves, tied by red ribbons to four stakes, is formed of the produce of their lands, wheat, palm, acorn, shamrock, and laurel. Very cool. Three of Wands. Three Alpine climbers, one Tyrolean, one Italian, and one French, courageously climb a rock face. Their attitudes correspond to Kabbalistic symbolism. The Tyrolean is reaching the top. The Italian rests with one foot on the rope to ensure the safety of the others. The Frenchman, having taken a rest, is catching up with the others. And they give the meaning as practical knowledge, business acumen, trade, commerce, negotiations. Two of Wands. What appears to be two clubs is really a single club broken in half. It's broken ends of flame. Perched among the halves of the club is Mephistopheles, the devil, in the legend of Dr. Faustus. Below, Dr. Faustus weeps. He traded his soul in return for unlimited magical knowledge but now he realizes the destruction that awaits him. His eyeglasses hang on a twig in front of him, referring to the symbolism of the number two. Ace of Wands. A large club burns with fire, the element represented by the suit of wands. In a nest, young Hercules strangles a snake that spits fire in its rage. Two gnomes dressed in red are at the bottom of the club. In folk tradition, gnomes are a symbol of strength, hard work, and enterprise. One toils with a saw, while the other sings a ballad. The hammer beneath the saw refers to the working class, the people of the suit of wands. Autumnal colors on some of the leaves of the club show the season of the suit. Moving on to cups. And I'm going through these the way the artist has them listed in the book, kind of backwards from king down to ace. King of Cups. The king, dressed in red and yellow, sits on a papal throne. He has the features of Pope Leo X, the great nepotist pope of the Renaissance. He wears red and green hose with garters embroidered with hearts. His hands are clad in pink gloves. In his right hand he holds a large cup shaped like the papal tiara, and with his left hand he clasps the hand of a fair blonde angel who holds a Chinese sunshade that shelters the king. The angel, who is like an altar boy, wears a pale blue robe covered by a white surplice embroidered with seashells. Under the king's feet are renderings of Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. Oh, isn't that cool? Look at that down there. In the background is the dome of St. Peter's Cathedral of Rome, and the bust of Venus de Milo is on the right. I've got to let you get a little closer look at the Mona Lisa renderings there. Very cool. Queen of Cups. This is a rather playful card. Three vessels float on the sea. A galleon, a shell, and a small paper boat with the artist's name. On the shell, in the same position as Botticelli's Venus, a nun stands. She wears gauzy pink veils around her body, and the blue veil around her head is crowned with hearts and a gold band. In her left hand, she holds a large green cup composed of wings and the head of a cherub. Some of her long blonde hair has come loose and ruffles in the wind. Very cute. I like that card a lot. It's quirky. Quirky and fun. Knight of Cups. The infamous Rasputin, advisor to the last Tsarina of Russia, rides a sneering mule over dry, stony ground. He wears the habit of the monks of Mount Athos, but his heavy boots and the fastenings of his coat indicate lawlessness and wealth. With his left hand, he holds the reins of the mule and points outward toward the card reader. 
A large silver chalice decorated with Cupid bending his bow is in his right hand. A crowd of peasants advances in the background. Very cool. Page of Cups. A young drummer, dressed in the costume of the Swiss Guards of the Vatican, stands in a green field. In the background is the monastery of Mount Athos. His face is meek and submissive, but in his hand is a yellow and red cup with an erotic scene of two winged lovers kissing. A drum hangs from his shoulder, and in his right hand is a blue copy book and a quill pen. And he is supposed to signify a studious and intent per person, reflectiveness, meditativeness, loyalty. Here is the Ten of Cups. Nine cups form towers in a town, with the tenth cup forming the entrance from the moat. In the center is the dome of the main temple, with a fountain at its summit. On the gate cup, at the bottom center, a couple stands, happily joined in the sacred bond of marriage. They are like the couple on the Ten of Cups in the Rider Waite tarot deck. The town is prospering, and various stages of construction can be seen in several places. Nine of Cups. The card is ruled by the ancient figure of victory who blows a trumpet and holds a laurel wreath. The prow of the ship below is guarded by St. Lucy, the patron of illumination and wisdom, who is symbolized by an eye. Nine cups are decorated with the figures of pregnant women. Eight of Cups. A crusader in armor and a blue cape embraces a woman in pink. Around them, eight cups show various themes of life. A youth confessing to a friar. A puppet theater showing Pulcinella with the sun and moon below a mask in the pediment. A procession in which young girls strew the streets with flower petals. An eagle clutching a frog. A veiled figure. A woman frightened by a giant spider. How much is there in there to take in and look at? That's amazing. Uh, a remorseful prisoner and a possessed person casting out a demon. Wow. And for the divinatory meaning, they have discontinuance of effort, disappointment, abandonment of previous plans, shyness, modesty, abandoned success. Very cool card. Seven of Cups. A woman sits sleeping in a Savonarola chair, and around her, dreams take shape. One bottle, imperfectly sealed with wax, is full of exhilarating liquor. A china cup shows her and her lover happy in their old age. A hookah, melting at the base, fumes. A silver cup is composed of all the passive ghosts of the dreamer herself. A golden cup is shaped like a lotus, and a cup of clouds is at the bottom right. The cup at the bottom left a clay Etruscan type cup has the dreamer's features and it is the only cup that retains its content. Six of Cups. Six cups describe different ways to face old age. On the black cup that holds dried up flowers, a widow tells the beads of her rosary. Next to her, a gaily colored lidded cup is for pleasure, hedonism, and sensuality. From it spills froth which a fool dressed in red avidly licks up. A wizard tends a jade cup as a bird and full of the symbols of the magic and occult arts. On the belly of the cup is Solomon's seal. On the foot of the Colossus of Rhodes, a Belfana sits knitting a sock. The Belfana is a good witch in Italy and in her cup are the toys and gifts she brings to children. A golden cup, which is the only one that has water in it, contains a lotus with two leaves, and under it an ascetic sits in meditation, holding a red flower in one hand. A monk of Mount Athos sits on the rim of a clay cup that was baked in the fire of divine love. In the cup are prayer books, and the laurel wreath around the cup is dried up. Amazing, everything that Scapini put into these cards. It's just Amazing. Five of Cups. A dying patriarch dictates his will, while five of his relatives gather around. At the foot of the bed, a notary records the information with the quill pen. The back of his chair diagrams the cabalistic tree of life. 
Hebrew letters on the cups are also Kabbalistic clues to the meanings of the card, as are the colors of the figure's clothes. The seahorses relate to aquatic and marine symbology. Two candles at the head of the bed indicate the symbolism of the number two. The cups are filled with green liquid, and one man, whose grief is sincere, cries into his cup. Four of Cups. A mermaid weeps on the back of an old sea serpent whose color suggests a grown cicada. A youth holding a ribbon of gold rides joyfully behind her on a serpent the color of a newly emerged cicada. I hope I'm saying that right. Cicada? 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 I don't know. He is the new Deus Ex Machina. The top left transparent amphora contains the legs of a woman frightened by a snake a spider, and a mouse, symbols of the primitive and instinctive part of the psyche that is usually repressed. The others show a blindfolded Eros, the god of erotic love, with his bow. Selenus, the perpetually drunk son of Pan, and a dying man in a desert, crawling with his last strength toward a mirage. Interesting. Three of Cups. Oh, I love the feeling of abundance that this automatically, as soon as you look at it, you get that sensation. Overflowing cups. Baroque details and ornamentation are in harmony with the overabundance symbolized by the three of cups. The bases of the cups are made of shells and dolphins. Two cups are full of ripe fruit and they ooze juice. The black cup contains spaghetti. The colors of the cups have alchemical symbolism. The black cup shows a woman removing her bandages since she has recovered. The sun shines behind her. The white cup shows a mason placing the keystone in an arch. On the right of the arch is the branch of an acacia, which Italian masons traditionally put on houses when the roof is ready to be built. On the golden cup is the divine hermaphrodite, crowned and holding a caduceus in each hand. He is the symbol of a successful alchemical transmutation. So you can look at it and just get the general feel of the card, or you can really dive into a lot of detail in this deck. It is what you make of it, or what you want to make of it. Two of Cups. Two lovers, dressed in the colors of the Page of Cups, gaze tenderly at one another. Towering behind them are two goblets. The silver cup has a base and stem formed of two twined snakes. On the cup, two lovers part. The woman weeps as the man walks away. His love letters in his hand. The golden cup contains amber liquid. Its stem and base is formed of a lion. And on the cup is a nymph and a satyr dance. Oh, and on the cup a nymph and a satyr dance lasciviously. In Western symbolism, gold symbolizes masculinity and silver femininity. Ace of Cups. A fountain represents the suit of cups. Its base is made up of broken ice and shells, with a pearl in the center. In spite of the ice, a mother tabby cat contentedly nurses her three kittens, black, white, and red, at the base. The stem of the fountain is made of sinuous dragon tail, tortoise shell, and a heart. The underside of the basin is made of swan feathers and luscious fruit. A woman sits in the basin, nursing two infants. She tramples a snake, and two horned dolphins guard her. At the sides, a sad face and a happy face spout water into the hexagonal basin. The fountain is topped with the dove of the Holy Spirit. From its beak, blood-colored drops fall first into the lotus flower beneath it, then through the fruits of the fountain basin and down the stem. King of Coins The King of Coins has the features of one of the last doges of Venice, Francesco Morosini. He is old and white-haired and his rich cloak is embroidered with thorny branches, illustrating the impossibility of maintaining even the best of worldly institutions. In his left hand is a compass, and in his right is the phoenix of hope and resurrection. In his lap is a red sack of gold coins. Seven open sacks around the throne reveal diamonds, gold rings, crowns, quartz crystals, pearls, gold coins, and gold ingots. In the background are the well-tended fields of the kingdom. Queen of Coins, how awesome is she? She is a boss. 
An exotic woman is dressed in billowing blue, gold, and pink robes, the colors for the suit of coins. She is like the allegory of Venice by Paolo Veronese. She tosses up a coin showing a mother nursing two babies, and from the golden bowl in her lap she lets fall an abundance of gold coins. She wears a Venetian crown like the king, for Venice was the Renaissance Republic with an aristocracy of rich merchants. The ground is green, and in the background is a cornfield in July, full of cornflowers and poppies. A rich dish of boiled ox head with a lemon in its mouth and carrots to the side is on the ground, along with a glass adorned with sapphires and filled with precious liqueur. To the right is a dish of pills and medicine. The queen rests her foot on a red cushion embroidered with an effigy of the cabalistic demon, Lucifuge Rosacal, whoever he is. Sorry, don't know all the references, but I'm just reading it to you from the book here. If you're interested, I guess you can Google it and look further. Knight of Coins. The great explorer Marco Polo rides a sturdy horse with a strong bit. He gazes out over the fabulous empire of Katai, beyond the Great Wall of China. Under his right arm he holds a coin emblazoned with a tortoise. Page of Coins. The page stands on a plaza littered after the great feast of carnival. The architecture of Venice can be seen in the background and some merrymakers dressed in the costumes of Commedia dell'arte still dance. The page's outfit has military detailing and his hat with flapping brims is decorated with coins. Over his shoulders is slung a bag of books along with the postillion horn. I don't know what postillion is. P-O-S-T-I-L-I-O-N a postillion horn. He holds a coin emblazoned with an image of the god Mercury. Very cool. That is a card I absolutely love. Here is the ten of coins. The turrets of an elegant and noble castle aspire upward. Superimposed is an oak tree whose roots are at the steps of the basement of the castle. A family tree is shown on the golden coins. nine of coins. A goat skull is on each of the nine coins. Between the coins weaves a flowing path, a oh, flowering path, excuse me. At the beginning of the path is a lost golden ring, and further along, Brigella, who is already introduced as the Page of Swords, looks behind. A woman holding a falcon is like the protagonist of the nine coins in the Rider Waite Tarot. A figure wearing a raincoat and carrying an umbrella is ready for the storms that lie ahead. I love this because that's my Rider Waite lady with the bird. I think that's probably my favorite card in the Rider Waite tarot. Is the nine of pentacles or coins. And there she is. The woman holding the bird. Very cool. Eight of coins. The artist of the medieval Scapini tarot chose this card to illustrate his own life while remaining faithful to the traditional symbolism of the card. His wife and eldest daughter appear in the center and their cat is on the floor. The artist climbs a stepladder to paint a coin showing the magician. The next coin down shows the Pope S with the sign of the moon below, then the Empress with Venus, the Emperor with Jupiter, and on the bottom left, strength with Mars. Then the star with Mercury. Judgment with Saturn and the world with the sun. The artist paints in the fashion he uses to make frescoes using a wand tipped with a ball to steady his left hand. So there's the artist of the deck and there he is painting his major arcana cards. I think that's lovely. Really lovely. Seven of coins. Five gamblers are seated at a table. The winner at the head of the table rejoices in his good fortune, and on the sides are figures resembling the pages of the various suits of the tarot. The page of swords on the lower left is desperate. His bag is empty, and he throws his cards wildly on the table. The page of cups across the table has confidence in his hand, keeping his cards hidden, except for three on the table. He bets one gold coin. The page of coins stares at the money that the winner drops like rain. He displays his losing card. 
The black page of wands lays down his cards cursing, but he is a good player and will probably not suffer badly in his defeat. The seven coins show from the right clockwise a sleeping child, a chest of gold, a soul in purgatory praying for release, the chariot of Saturn, a full moon, a lily, and a tree bearing fruit. At the bottom, the artist's signature appears in a stone tablet along with the date, the tradition of medieval fresco painters. So there you have a very intricate seven of coins. Six of coins. A sentinel with a stout lance guards six coins. The coins illustrate the meaning of the cards with different scenes. A miser. The chariot of Jupiter a fool who has lost everything, and a fool happy for a sudden win, a mandala rose, and a rich man giving a poor man money from a scale. Five of coins. A youth mischievously kisses a lady's hand. Theirs is an illicit relationship. In the center is a coin showing the chariot of Mars. The other coins represent disorder caused by violence and desire corresponding to the four elements. Fire and earth at the top and air and water at the bottom. Very cool. So we've got fire and earth, air and water. Four of coins. A nun smiles as she unwraps a secret gift. On the left, a glass vase exhales a precious essence, and on the right is a closed asphodel flower. The roots of the coins spiral. In the top coins are the chariot of the moon and a swan swimming in the moonlight. At the bottom are the boundary wall of a castle and a mysterious cat in a cage. That's a very fun card. Three of coins. Three coins show the chariot of Venus, the ruler Caesar, and a dancing figure with a tambourine. The roots of the coins hold crystals. On the right is a monument to a great man who resembles Leonardo da Vinci but is really symbolic of a person versed in the arts, the occult, science, and other pursuits. Two of Coins. The story of Susanna and the elders from the Old Testament is illustrated around the coins. Susanna dresses after her bath, gazing at herself in a precious mirror. In the coin above is the triumph of Mercury, and below is a library with an ink pot and quill. Wow, look how detailed these books are in the library. My goodness. That's amazing. What a beautiful, beautiful card. I love Susanna's face. All right, and then now to the last card. I hope I haven't been boring you too much by reading. I think these are just fascinating, though. Here is the Ace of Coins. The great coin has earthy roots in which rocks and crystals dangle. The coin is held by a blue-winged boy who is blindfolded with a red banner that twines around his body. Two sprouts are at the bottom of the card. The coin illustrates the age of gold. In the foreground of the coin is a treasure. A king and queen lie nude, eating a bunch of grapes. On the left and right are the fruit trees of the Garden of Hesperides. Nearby are an ox and a lamb, a young man playing a panpipe, a dancing child with a tambourine, and another child playing happily, under a golden calf wearing the headdress of Hathor, the Egyptian goddess of love, a couple dances. At the top, an arch of flowers opens to a road that leads to a sacred mountain. So that is a very prolonged walkthrough 
of the Medieval Scapini Tarot. I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough. It's a little more detailed than I normally do, but I just thought this deck deserved a little extra attention. I didn't see any other, uh, very few other, I should, can't say I didn't see any other, but I saw very few other walkthroughs and uh, nothing really about what's in the little white book and the information on the symbolism in the cards. So I hope that was helpful to you. If you were considering buying this deck and you were interested to learn more about it, there you have it. So take care. Have a pleasant day.